Hello everyone, this video is about hemostasis. In section 1 I will review the physiology of hemostasis with an emphasis on the relatively modern cell-based model. After that I will look at how we assess hemostasis in the laboratory, including traditional coagulation times, viscoelastic assays like Rotom, as well as the lesser discussed field of platelet function testing. Before we get started, I'm an Australian ICU trainee. I don't have any financial conflicts of interest, including drugs, devices or books. Part 1. Our understanding of blood clotting has come a long way. It's not just the so-called waterfall model that you might have seen in medical school. It's an integrated process involving coagulation factors, platelets, blood vessels and inflammatory cells. I had to include this video because it's probably the single best depiction of in vivo hemostasis I've seen. It's from a group of researchers in Massachusetts and depicts intravital microscopy of a mouse arteriole that is injured by a laser. The researchers have labelled platelets in red and fibrin in green to show the different spatial and temporal phases of clot formation. Also, pay attention to what happens to the vessel itself. Almost immediately, there is significant vasoconstriction that slows the flow of blood, reducing hemorrhage and assisting in clot formation. We also see an initial platelet plug forming in red at the site of injury. These two processes are known as primary hemostasis. Next, we have secondary hemostasis involving coagulation factors leading to the production of fibrin. Coagulation can be divided into initiation, amplification, propagation, termination, and finally lysis. This process happens simultaneously and synergistically with the adhesion, activation, and aggregation of platelets. I'm going to start by talking about platelets, an essential but sometimes neglected element of hemostasis. It is possible to see platelets on a blood film with the right staining, in which case they look something like this. By volume, they are about nine times smaller than erythrocytes, and they are about 20 times less numerous. I find it interesting that these miniature cells take up such a small proportion of the volume of blood, but can find a way to the site of injury in sufficient numbers to help plug a hemorrhage. By comparison, if I was to depict fibrinogen particles on this slide, there would be about 2 billion, or about 250 per pixel in 4K. Comparing this with the relatively sparse platelets, you can think of coagulation factors as a ubiquitous part of the plasma but kept inactive under most circumstances, while platelets act as coordination centers for the hemostatic process. Let's look closer at platelets. Despite their minuscule size, platelets are sophisticated systems with active mitochondrion signaling pathways. Like coagulation factors, they circulate in the plasma in an inactive state, maintained by endothelial factors. If you've seen my video on pulmonary hypertension, the next part might seem a bit familiar. Platelet physiology bears a striking resemblance to vascular smooth muscle with almost identical signaling pathways. I'll keep the same color scheme with teal green representing quiescent or anti-thrombotic factors and pathways, and purple representing pro-activation or thrombotic signals and pathways. The same endothelial signals that inhibit vascular smooth muscle contraction also inhibit platelets. For example, prostacyclin acts on the IP receptor activating the G-protein-coupled alpha-S pathway, stimulating CAMP and protein kinase A. Meanwhile, stimulating factors such as thromboxane A2, which is also a vasoconstrictor, acts on the Q11 calcium pathway. ADP stimulates Q11 via the P2Y1 receptor, as well as IO via the P2Y12 receptor. The IO pathway inhibits CAMP and also stimulates PI3K with the beta-gamma subunits. As with vascular smooth muscle, there is also the 1213 pathway associated with the small non-trimeric GTPase protein Rho, which toggles between inactive, inactive and active and activates its own effector kinase known as ROC. Receptors activating the 1213 pathway as well as the Q11 pathway include the serotonin 2A receptor and, the, and PAR1 and 4. The PAR receptors are unique thrombin receptors that are activated through irreversible cleavage by thrombin rather than reversible agonist binding. Thrombin is the most potent endogenous agonist for platelet activation. What is platelet activation? 
it's not one single event, but a combination of processes, some of which can happen reversibly. One major element involves a second small G protein, BRAP1B. Like Rho, it toggles between active and inactive based on stimulating and inhibiting factors. For example, PIP3, an alternative lipid signaling molecule produced by PI3K, inhibits inactivation of RAP, while calcium and DAG activate it more directly. Both pathways are activated by some non-G protein coupled receptors that participate in platelet adhesion. Glycoprotein 6 is an immunoglobulin related receptor that is the primary collagen receptor for platelets and potently stimulates platelet activation. Glycoprotein 1b exists as part of a complex and assists with platelet adhesion. Under pathological high shear conditions, it binds transiently to von Willebrand factor and allows platelets to roll along a surface before definitive binding by other receptors. Deficiency of this complex causes a bleeding disorder called bernard solia syndrome, while GP1b gain of function also causes bleeding that mimics von Willebrand disease, known as platelet type or pseudo von Willebrand disease. The last second messenger pathway should be a more familiar one, the cyclic GMP pathway again stimulated by nitric oxide. Like in vascular smooth muscle, it complements the CAMP pathway and inhibits Q11 and 1213 mediated activation. So RAP is one switch involved in activation. What happens when we switch it on? It leads to so-called inside out signaling, switching two different integrin receptors to high affinity states. The alpha two beta one receptor, formerly 1A2A, enhances platelet adhesion to collagen. The most important platelet receptor is the alpha-2 beta-3 integrin, formerly known as glycoprotein 2b3a. When active, it binds primarily to fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor, which can connect it to other activated platelets, a process known as aggregation. Defects of this receptor cause Glanzmann's thrombosthenia, which can cause severe bleeding. The next important switch involved in platelet activation is the myosin regulatory light chain, again mirroring the process of smooth muscle stimulation. This is activated by myosin light chain kinase, particularly by the calcium calmodulin pathway and inhibited by myosin light chain phosphatase. Once activated, it leads to contraction of actinomyosin filaments, causing a series of changes to the platelet shape. The disc spherizes and extends projections called fil filipodia to enhance adhesion and aggregation. Further changes involve remodeling of actin, involving remodeling of actin lead to the platelet spreading over the damaged area to resemble a fried egg. Once the thrombus is established, platelets contract, reducing the volume of the clot and assisting in remodeling in the healing process. Another feature of activated platelets involves their lipid membrane. Platelets support coagulation factors through expression of certain phospholipids such as phosphatidylserine, but only when activated. In their inactive state, ATP-driven enzymes known as flipases and flopases fight entropy to keep the procoagulant phospholipids on the inner side of the lipid bilayer, with more inert molecules such as phosphatidylcholine on the outside. When intracellular calcium rises in the activated platelet, this activates an enzyme called scramblase, which allows phosphatidylserine to be expressed on either membrane, turning the platelet surface into a procoagulant environment. Intracellular calcium also activates phospholipase A2, which produces arachidonic acid from membrane phospholipids, the first step in the prostaglandin synthesis pathway, in this case producing thromboxane A2, which further stimulates nearby platelets in a form of positive feedback. Myosin contraction also leads to granule secretion. Dense granules contain procoagulant molecules, including a high concentration of calcium and ADP, which also participate in positive feedback stimulation, stabilizing platelet aggregates. Alpha granules contain a vast assortment of mostly procoagulant molecules, notably factor 
factor 5 and fibrinogen, as well as platelet membrane receptors, healing and growth factors, and some inflammatory mediators. Now we can look at the site of action of some antiplatelet drugs. Aspirin has a brief half-life of 15 to 20 minutes, but irreversibly inhibits COX-1, inactivating thromboxane A2 synthesis for the lifespan of the platelet, which is about a week. It is some, sometimes combined with the phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, dipyridamol, which functions as a platelet inhibitor and vasodilator. Another route of platelet inhibition targets the other arm of positive feedback, ADP. Clopidogrel and prasiogrel are prodrugs whose metabolites irreversibly inhibit the PCY12 receptor, while ticagrelor directly and reversibly inhibits the same receptor. None of these agents target the core pathways for platelet activation or aggregation, but the anti-alpha-2 beta-3 agents do. Abasiximab and tarifiban cause profound platelet inhibition and tend to be used only briefly in acute coronary syndromes and PCI. Vorapaxa is a novel PAR1 inhibitor that inhibits thrombin-mediated activation. Prostacyclin and nitric oxide cause platelet inhibition in the same fashion as the endogenous forms that are produced by the endothelium. Platelets adhere to collagen and become activated. They initially form a monolayer of platelets that support adhesion of further activated platelets. In a similar schema to the cell-based model of coagulation, some have termed this initiation, with the next stage being adhesion of further platelets, positive feedback signaling, and aggregation through alpha-2, beta-3 bridges. The final stage is stabilization, involving outside-in signaling through the integrins that prevent deaggregation. De now we need to look at humoral factors. Apart from collagen, extravascular cells such as fibroblasts express tissue factor, the initiating factor for the co coagulation cascade. Tissue factor has also been called tissue thromboplastin, or coagulation factor 3. Deficiency of tissue factor is not compatible with life due to fatal hemorrhage, as seen with total deficiencies of factor 7, 10, 5, and prothrombin. This is the primary activation pathway for coagulation in vivo. About 1% of coagulation factor 7 circulates in its activated form, although to start coagulation it requires tissue factor. They combine to form the so-called extrinsic tenase, which can activate factor 10 and factor 9. 10A can activate more factor 7, which can activate more factor 9 and 10. Some factor 9 can diffuse away, although 10A stays localized to the tissue site. 10A can also slowly activate factor 5, which vastly accelerates thrombin formation. This small amount of thrombin can cause local amplification as well as leave the site. Coagulation is a dangerous positive feedback cascade, and even when appropriate, its initiation needs to be closely regulated. One method for this is limiting the site of its initiation and amplification to specific cell membranes. This is one of the core features of the cell-based model. For an, the initiation phase, there is also a protein called tissue factor pathway inhibitor, which mops up free factor 10A, and together they inhibit further activation by the extrinsic tenase. The small burst of thrombin also generates fibrin by cleaving small A and B peptides from fibrinogen, which allow it to polymerize. Fibrin mesh coats the initial site of tissue factor exposure, further inhibiting the initiation phase, although by this point enough thrombin has been formed to start the amplification phase. The second site in the cell-based model of coagulation is the platelet plug. There is a small amount of escape factor 9A and thrombin from the tissue factor exposure site. Thrombin triggers platelet activation and the release of factor 5. It then activates factors 8 and 11. 11A activates more factor 9, which forms the intrinsic 10As with 8A, and then 10A and 5A pro form prothrombinase, leading to exponential amplification of thrombin production. Fibrin polymer polymerizes throughout the platelet plug, attaching to alpha-2 beta-3 receptors and binding the structure together. The large quantity of thrombin activates factor 13, which cross-links fibrin with covalent bonds 
reinforcing the structure and making it more resistant to fibrinolysis. We now enter the propagation phase as coagulation activates more platelets which support more coagulation. Coagulation needs to be terminated once it leaves the region of injury. At this point, we don't have any new initiation via the tissue factor pathway, just amplification and propagation through factor 11, the intrinsic tenase and prothrombinase, with the latter two complexes bound to activated platelets. For the complexes, factors 9A and 10A are the active enzymes, while 8A and 5A are the cofactors, which function like an accelerator pedal for the respective complex. In terms of importance, 5 and 10 are essential for life, while complete deficiency of either factor 8 or 9 cause haemophilia A and B respectively, due to the loss of amplification by the intrinsic 10As complex. Loss of factor 11 causes a milder bleeding disorder that has been called haemophilia C. In order to terminate propagation in the presence of healthy endothelium, some thrombin binds to thrombomodulin, which is attached to endothelial cells, leading to the activation of protein C. With its cofactor, protein S, activated protein C inactivates the cofactors 5A and 8A, releasing the accelerator pedal. In the thrombophilia factor V laden, Factor 5A is relatively resistant to this inactivation. The active enzymes 9, 10, 11, and thrombin are inactivated by a different protein, antithrombin. This forms an irreversible bond with the factor inactivating it. The affinity of antithrombin is enhanced 1 to 4,000 fold by polysaccharides such as heparin sulfate, which exists on the endothelial surface again localizing the termination phase to areas with healthy endothelium. Some quantity of antithrombin, thrombomodulin, protein S, protein C, and tissue factor pathway inhibitor are all necessary for life, as without them there would be de deadly uncontrolled thrombosis. The thrombin-thrombomodulin complex also activates tissue activatable inhibitor of fibrinolysis, or TAFI, which I'll discuss in the next section. In this section, we'll look at fibrinolysis and its regulation. Again, we see fibrin polymerizing and being reinforced with covalent crosslinks by factor 13A. It also incorporates proteins such as alpha-2 antiplasmin, which inhibits plasminogen binding and helps to prevent fibrinolysis in a well-established clot. The drug tranexamic acid competitively inhibits plasminogen binding to fibrin preventing fibrinolysis in a similar fashion. To be activated to plasmin, plasminogen requires both fibrin and tissue plasminogen activator, which binds with it to fibrin and is regulated by plasminogen activator inhibitors. This extensive regulation is necessary because once active, plasmin cleaves fibrin at numerous locations, exposing more terminal lysine sites for plasminogen activation in another positive feedback mechanism. Plasmin is inhibited by alpha-2 antiplasmin and alpha-2 macroglobulin, while TPA is inhibited by PAI1 and 2. PAI2 is present in significant quantities during pregnancy and contributes to a prothrombotic state. D-dimers are an example of fibrin degradation product, specifically of fibrin that was cross-linked by factor 13A. The enzyme TAFI-A effectively cauterizes the wound on fibrin by cleaving exposed terminal lysine sites and preventing further plasminogen activation. As it is activated by thrombin with thrombomodulin, it is somewhat similar to factor 13, preventing fibrin breakdown when there is intense thrombin production. We're now up to part two, laboratory assessment of coagulation. First, I'm going to outline three distinct settings where we might want to assess coagulation because some tests are better suited to some purposes or the results might have different significance. The child represents primary disorders of hemostasis. These are uncommon and relatively specialized. You would perform these tests if a patient presents with excessive bleeding, unprovoked thrombosis, or perhaps a strong family history. Testing could be divided into broad and then narrow diagnostic tests as well as monitoring, for example, 
for patients that might need factor replacement. Many tests, such as those quantifying specific factors, are mostly performed by haematologists and are outside the scope of this video. The next group I have labelled secondary or screening. They might be the young adult who presents with a traumatic hemorrhage or has an acquired condition such as liver disease or snake bite that affects the coagulation. In, if these patients are coagulopathic, it might be multifaceted and dynamic and not just due to a sig single abnormal factor or receptor. The third group is the other common one that we see in critical care, those on antithrombotic medications. Some drugs like warfarin and heparin are unpredictable and need therapeutic drug monitoring. You might just want to double check that a patient's taking their tablets. We don't use much warfarin anymore because direct agents tend to have more reliable pharmacology and in some cases lower overall bleeding risk. We still do use warfarin in high risk settings such as prosthetic heart valves and many cases of antiphospholipid syndrome. One advantage of vitamin K antagonists like warfarin is that they are regular, regularly monitored. It reassures us that the patient is taking the drug and that the level of anticoagulation is within a range that we have decided is effective and safe. We might also want to check that a drug effective, is effective in that specific patient. For example, there are SIP polymorphisms that mean that clopidogrel will be ineffective in a given patient. If a patient needs P2Y12 inhib inhibition for a coronary or neurointerventional stent, you might have to check that the drug is actually achieving that. Finally, there are situations where you want to assess ongoing drug effect, particularly if the patient is bleeding or suspected to be over anticoagulated and might need reversal agents. In some ways, these patients are more like the primary disorder group because they tend to have a relatively specific abnormality that has important implications for testing and management. A patient on dual antiplatelet therapy might have a relatively normal rosum trace, but a massively increased bleeding tendency. A major part of all of these assessments is history, both in choosing what tests to perform and interpreting the results. Conceptually placing the patient in one of these three categories might be a useful first step. I'm going to start with the most well-known tests of coagulation function. They start with one of these tubes containing sodium citrate, which binds to calcium, depriving coagulation factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 of an essential cofactor. The sample is then centrifuged. This removes blood cells and platelets, leaving a citrated sample of what's known as platelet-poor plasma. Calcium needs to be added back to the sample to allow coagulation to proceed. Because the sample is platelet depleted, phospholipid also needs to be added as a substitute for platelet membranes. Without any cells or platelets, the plasma sample is almost completely translucent, which is the key to how many of these tests are performed nowadays in an automated setting. An activated, activating agent such as tissue factor is added to initiate coagulation. After a period of time, thrombin activates fibrinogen, which polymerizes into fibrin, which makes the solution opaque and that is detected optically. The time taken for visible fibrin to form is typically the output value of the test. These tests are methodologically quite reproducible, but quite distinct also from the in vivo process. This means they are best suited to identifying a very specific abnormality such as drug effect or deficiency of a relevant factor and less reflective of the patient as a whole. For example, a patient who is profoundly thrombocytopenic might just have a normal INR simply because phospholipid was artificially added to the sample. For example, to measure the prothrombin or thromboplastin time, calcium and phospholipid are added plus tissue factor. This activates the tissue factor or initiation or extrinsic pathway until thrombin is produced. It activates fibrin, which is optically detected. This is often standardized to the international normalized ratio or INR to eliminate lab variation. It's a reasonable measure of a single element of coagulation, the time from initiation to detectable fibrin, controlling for platelet function and not really assessing clot strength or amplification or clot breakdown. Because it heavily features factors with vitamin K dependent GLA modifications, the best established use for the INR is monitoring the efficacy of warfarin therapy. It is also a useful marker of liver synthetic function, but does not reliably correlate with bleeding risk in that case, as the liver produces all prothrombotic factors besides von Willebrand factor 
as well as many anti-thrombotic factors, for example, protein S and C, which are also vitamin K dependent. INR will be abnormal in some other coagulopathic states. Because of the nature of uh, positive feedback, INR is particularly sensitive for abnormalities in factor seven and relatively insensitive to abnormalities further down the pathway. For example, patients on DOAX that inhibit 10A and 2A or thrombin tend to have an INR in the normal to mildly elevated range. Now we're onto the partial thromboplastin time. It's called that because the sample has phospholipid and calcium matter, but no tissue factor. This is the first time I'm going to explicitly address the contact activation pathway because it has very little significance in vivo. A complete deficiency of factor 12 will elevate the partial thromboplastin time, but tends to be asymptomatic. Early versions of this test may have just relied on the glass, but now they use a specific activator such as silica or allergic acid making it the activated PTT. Because the uh, cascade is inhibited by antithrombin at many points, it's a sensitive test for the effect of heparin and remains a common means of monitoring heparin therapy. Although anti-10A assays seem to be becoming, the, be becoming the gold standard. Again, it's less sensitive lower in the cascade for more narrowly, narrowly targeted drugs like anoxaparin, fundaparinox and DOAX. The final measurement relies on thrombin and fibrin formation like the INR. As mentioned, factor 12 deficiency and the haemophilias will elevate the APTT. There are no equivalents in absolute deficiency for the INR as that pathway is essential for life. Another cause for elevated APTT is the presence of inhibitors, for example, antibodies to factor eight. These can be further evaluated with mixing studies where normal plasma is partially added to the patient sample. This will be adequate to correct a deficiency, but will not correct completely in the presence of an inhibitor. There are also a heap of very clever variations of this. For example, titrating a patient's plasma against dilutions of plasma that's known to be missing one factor, and then determining prothrombin time, drawing a heap of graphs and determining from there an approximation, uh, approximate concentration of factor 10, for example. Next, I'm gonna talk about the anti-10A assay, which is becoming increasingly useful for drug monitoring. It's a bit different to the previous two tests, but still uses platelet-poor plasma. An excess known quantity of factor 10A is added to the sample. If inhibitors such as heparin analogs or DOAX are present, they will inhibit a fraction of the added enzyme. Next, a substrate is added, which is a short peptide with paranitroaniline attached to the end, designed to be a substrate for factor 10A. The 10A cleaves the PNA group from the end of the substrate, and after a set period of time, the reaction is terminated. The, pre the free PNA can then be detected as it's known to absorb a certain frequency of light the absorption is measured and used to determine the amount of 10A inhibition. This can be further converted to an effective drug concentration, for example, for a direct 10A inhibitor or to a standardized measure of units per mil. We're now moving further down the common pathway. The thrombin time is another test for inhibitors, this time for 2A, though it relies on fibrinogen as a substrate. A relatively dilute quantity of factor 2A thrombin is added to a sample, and then the time to fibrin formation is determined by the usual method. Because it's so low in the cascade, it's only really sensitive to deficiency or abnormalities of fibrinogen and thrombin inhibitors. Inhibitors include unfractionated heparin and direct agents like dabigatran, argatraban, and bivalirudin. The echerin clotting time is similar, but creates an active intermediate called mesothrombin from prothrombin, which is direct, affected by direct thrombin inhibitors, but not by heparin. There are so many snake venom assays, it's amazing. The last one is one we probably do use every day, the high dose thrombin time or Klaus fibrinogen assay. It's almost exactly the same as the thrombin time, except the patient sample is diluted by about one in 10 or one in 20, and then far more thrombin than previous is added, about 50 times more. 
to overwhelm any inhibitors that might be present. Therefore, the only variable left is going to be the availability of fibrinogen. The, the time is measured as before, except the time is now plotted on a nomogram and converted to an effective fibrinogen concentration. This is how fibrinogen levels are measured in many institutions, including ours. Now we're on to something a bit more fun, viscoelastic assays. No more platelet depleted plasma we're dealing with whole blood now, though often still citrated for transport and then reactivated with calcium. The previous tests are pretty good for anticoagulant monitoring, but don't give you a global assessment of hemostasis that you might want in a bleeding trauma patient or a variceal bleed, for example. Instead of optical detection of fibrin, these record firmness of a blood clot as it forms over time, which is probably more clinically relevant. This is a top-down view of the apparatus in the Rotom device. There's also TEG and a couple of newer ones, but I'm most familiar with Rotom, so that's what I'm going to talk about here. It has a small plastic cup with a blood sample and a rotating pin in the center. A motor moves back and forth, which indirectly applies torque to the pin via a spring. The pin has a mirror, which rotates with it and reflects a light source onto a photosensor array to measure the angle without touching the pin. This is processed to obtain the trace of resistance to rotation over time. This is what the setup looks like from the side. Without resistance, it rotates through 4.75 degrees in six seconds, which is very slow. So from now on, I'll speed it up tenfold for clarity. Now the blood is activated with calcium plus an optional activating and inhibiting factors depending on the specific assay. As the clot forms, the pin encounters resistance against the spring and the amplitude of the rotation is reduced, which is detected on the sensor. This means that the output trace that we see is actually inverted. If there's no movement of the pin, it would output a maximal 100 millimeter amplitude. And then with full rotation of the pin, the output is zero, which you see as a green line. The trace turns from pink to blue once the amplitude exceeds 20 millimeters. A nice thing about these machines is that providers can see the output in real time, and it may give useful information well before the full run is complete, which can be up to an hour. Let's look closer at the output. There are a bunch of different assays like there are for the optical fibrinogen tests. XTEM is the equivalent of the standard thromboplastin test, except for whole blood. It adds calcium for citrate and tissue factor as we see in vivo. It doesn't need extra phospholipid because it has the patient's own platelets this time. On the trace, we can see a much more nuanced assessment of phases of coagulation, including initiation before any fibrin is formed, amplification as the output rapidly increases, propagation as the firmness increases over time, and termination as the firmness stabilizes. Finally, fibrinolysis as the amplitude decreases, usually only slightly from maximum. There are a number of interesting elements to this sort of trace. For example, the angle or gradient at which the graph initially takes off is a combination of the speed at which thrombus is propagating in the sample and the strength of the clot being formed. The final shape is the result of even more factors such as the degree and extent of fibrinolysis. The final amplitude is the result of contributions from both fibrin and platelets, with platelets providing the majority in most cases. We can demonst demonstrate this um, with a second Rotom assay, the FibTem. FibTem is simply XTEM with the addition of a potent platelet inhibitor cytochalasin D. This is an example of normal traces for both XTEM and FibTem. The FibTem is pink, pink because it, the amplitude doesn't reach 20 millimeters, which is typical. I won't dwell on the specific measurements or normal values as you won't remember them from a video and they're called slightly different things between TEG and Rotem, for example. It's more important to look learn to spot particular patterns. Let's look at another example. The normal trace is in black dotted lines for comparison. You can see the amplitude is decreased on both and more significantly declines over time. The primary disorder here is hyperfibrinolysis. Rosum has another assay called Aptum with a fibrinolysis inhibitor that's designed to show you if the trace would be normal if corrected for hyperfibrinolysis, but I don't think that's necessary in this case. It's clear that hyper hyperfibrinolysis is the main problem, 
as you can see the amplitude drop off by about two thirds from maximum. Aptem might be useful if there was barely any amplitude at all, which could be seen in either a severe fibrinogen deficiency or profound fibrinolysis, but in this case we can see enough. The clinical intervention for this scenario would be um, to give a fibrinolysis inhibitor like tranexamic acid and then reassess the patient and probably repeat the study. This is probably one of the biggest advances advantages of viscoelastic assays because there's no other routine um, testing method that would show you hyperfibrinolysis. For the next one, there's hardly any lysis, but the amplitude of both is decreased, disproportionately so on the FibTem. From the FibTem, you know that the fibrinogen is inadequate, so start with that. The treatment is to give cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate, probably a large dose. Your institution's massive transfusion protocol will likely have a dosing guide based on viscoelastic assay. Then again, you can reassess to see if that's worked or if there's any further abnormalities. For this one, the XTEM is almost exactly the same, but the FibTEM is adequate this time. What's the other contrib contributor to amplitude? Platelets. This is the pattern seen in thrombocytopenia or very severe platelet dysfunction. The treatment is probably to give platelets. Note again that thrombin is the most potent endogenous activator of platelets, and due to the large quantity of thrombin produced in this setting, rotum amplitude is generally insensitive to the effect of aspirin or PTY12 inhibitors, which just work on secondary amplification pathways. Alpha-2, beta-3 inhibitors like tyrofiban and abasiximab will have will have an effect on amplitude, particularly in higher doses, as they are very potent placement inhibitors. In that case, you will see a trace like this, um, with the XTEM closer resembling the FibTEM as the platelet contribution is smaller. In this one, we have a marked increase in clotting time with a slight decrease in amplitude. The main pathology here is likely factor deficiency or inhibition, particularly the core tissue factor pathway. In a hemorrhage, the treatment would be FFP. If there were concerns for causing fluid overload or the patient was had specific vitamin K deficiency, you could use prothrombin uh, complex concentrate instead. Now, you wouldn't necessarily ask for an intemp assay unless you knew the patient was on anticoagulant therapy. It's always important to consider the context. If XTEM is the equivalent of prothrombin time, this is the equivalent of the APTT. They also have a specific heparinase assay to negate the effect of heparin, confirming the diagnosis in this case. This might be useful if the patient was on ECMO or in cardiac surgery and you didn't know if heparin effect was the only abnormality. The treatment for this coagulopathy would be protamine to reverse the heparin. Now, if you were confident it was mostly just the heparin effect, do you need a whole rotum for this? We might just want a point of care APTT equivalent that you don't have to centrifuge. The activated clotting time is just that. It's a typically mechanical whole blood assay that assesses time to clot formation when stimulated by the contact pathway. One time that the clot contact activation pathway might actually be useful to consider is extracorporeal circulation as it is the primary initiating factor for clot formation in that case. One difference is that they usually don't even use citrate for an ACT, just whole blood. There's different mechanisms based on um, different devices, but one example uses a plunger that passively falls through a sample of blood which sits on a contact activator in a tube. It is lifted up regularly and when the viscosity increases enough to delay the fall, it's detected by an attached flag with a laser. It doesn't perfectly correlate with APTT, because, which tends to be about a third as long, give or take, as APTT also eliminates the platelet effect, for example. There's a lot more variables involved with the ACT. Finally, we move on to platelet function tests. Thinking of our three uh, patient groups, you're go mostly going to look at these if you suspect a primary platelet disorder or they're on antiplatelet drugs. For the screening or secondary group, you'll probably be fine with a platelet count and a rotum as there's unlikely to be a specific biochemical lesion to identify. The simplest test of primary hemostasis is the bleeding time, which just needs a lancet, a clock, and some filter paper.
if you're a hematologist, there's a ton of tests you could ask for, ranging all the way to electron microscopy of the platelets themselves. But the gold standard for a general overview of platelet function is probably light transmission agrogometry. Unlike the clotting assays, this uses platelet-rich plasma that hasn't been centrifuged quite as much, although it's usually also an anticoagulator with citrate. Now the solution is going to be a bit cloudy due to all the platelets floating around and we can quantify this. Next you add an agonist to stimulate the platelets and once they aggregate the transmission of light should increase. Over time this can show interesting patterns with waves of primary and secondary aggregation. The precise choice of agonists um, may depend on what abnormality that you're expecting to find and they can be divided into strong and weak agonists. Strong include collagen, thrombin, and thromboxane A2, which induce aggregation, thromboxane synthesis, and granule secretion, while weaker agonists such as ADP and adrenaline can induce aggregation without secretion and enhance the other pathways. Arachidonic acid is used in some platelet function tests as a pro form of thromboxane A2. Thrombin receptor activating peptide is sometimes used instead of thrombin, and ristocetin is a weak agonist that enhances signaling through glycoprotein 1b and von Willebrand factor. It only causes agglutination rather than true aggregation. This level of testing would typically be used for suspected uh, platelet disorders such as bernard solia syndrome or Glanzmann's thrombosthenia. Now you might just be thinking, I'm not a hematologist diagnosing rare uh, platelet disorders. I just want to know if the stent's going to stay open now that I've started clopidogrel on someone. So what's the quick and easy yes or no activated clotting time version of a platelet aggregation study? It's probably this, verify now. It's the same principle but uses citrated whole blood. The aggregation is obviously not going to be as clear as for nice centrifuge plasma. So to exaggerate the cloudiness, they added a bunch of tiny polystyrene beads coated in fibrinogen. Next, you put in an agonist and use light to see the increase in transmission again. It features one assay for P2Y12 inhibitors with ADP and prostaglandin E1 to blunt the effect of P2Y1. Another one is for aspirin using arachidonic acid, which is converted to thromboxane A2 if COX-1 is not inhibited. The device uses a also uses a thrombin receptor activating peptide to determine a baseline light transmission with a strong agonist and uses this to calculate reaction units for aspirin and P2Y12. It's not as sensitive and doesn't give you the longitudinal readings, but it's quick and easy. It apparently needs about 10 minutes incubation and then gives a result after another five. Impedance agrogometry is another way to bypass the optical problem with anticoagulated whole blood. It's used in the multi-plate device as well as platelet function test that's packaged with Rotem. The capabilities of the multi-plate device are significantly closer to the gold standard LTA than Verify Now. It can use a large variety of agonists and provides continuous output. Let's see how it works. Impedance is similar to resistance, but for alternating current. A pair of electrode wires are placed in the sample and an alternating current is passed through back and forth, measuring the impedance over time. When an agonist is added, the platelets are stimulated and aggregate on the electrodes, increasing the impedance, which is detected and plotted. Finally, I wanted to co briefly cover the PFA100, which is an interesting device. Like Verify Now, it's fast, simple, and easy to use, except Verify Now is designed to answer a couple of very specific questions. The PFA100 is much less specific. It was designed partly to replace the bleeding time as a more physiologically based screen of primary hemostasis. One particular advantage is incorporating high shear blood flow into the testing, making it sensitive for all but the mildest cases of von Willebrand disease. If negative, the patient is unlikely to have a significant disorder of primary hemostasis, but if abnormal, they will likely require further testing. It uses a tiny volume, about 800 microliters of citrate of blood, which is drawn up a tube by a vacuum where it reaches a membrane with a hole in it. The membrane is coated with collagen and another agonist, either ADP or adrenaline. As the blood flows through, the platelets aggregate and eventually will occlude the hole. The occlusion is detected using pressure and the output is the time taken for occlusion.
I think it's a neat device, although you probably wouldn't need it if you had access to something like Multiplate. The main re reference for this assessment section was the amazing website practicalhemostasis.com. It probably has all the information on clotting tests you would ever want to know. If you want something a bit more introductory, check out learnheme.com. I particularly like their simple descriptions of clotting time assays, which directly inspired that optical section. For something a bit more clinical, check out this page on COAGS on the Internet Book of Critical Care. Link will be in the description. Deranged Physiology also has a couple of great pages on viscoelastic tests with a lot of visual examples. My main reference for platelet physiology is this amazing book on platelets. You wouldn't think you could have a book this long entirely on platelets, but I do and it's great. I also reference a couple of hematology textbooks as well as these. The um, trauma one's very good and has some good fibrinolysis content. Um, there was also a couple that were more lab oriented. I also used a bunch of journal articles. I'll try to link those in the description. Thanks for watching. I only decided to finish this one because I'd mostly pre-researched it. With my exam coming up in August, I will probably be inactive for the next few months, um, but I can't wait to make something new following that. In the meantime, please subscribe and check out the rest of my basic science playlist.